Part 3 Ethics Based Selective Irregular Warfare to Governor William Tyron and all such tyrants. Whereas it has become apparent to the citizens of Bavarian Gulch that there is no security for life and property, either under the regulations of society as it at present exists, or under the so-called law as now administered. Therefore we, whose names are hereunto attached, do unite themselves into an association for the maintenance of the peace and good order of society, and the preservation of the lives and property of the people of Bavarian Gulch, and do bind ourselves, each unto the other, to do and perform every lawful act for the maintenance of true natural law and order, and to sustain those laws when faithfully and properly administered. But we are determined that no thief, highwayman, politician, banker, or murderer shall escape punishment, either by the quibbles of the so-called law, the insincerity of persons, the carelessness or corruption of the police, or a laxity of those who pretend to administer justice. Harmon Husband V, John V. Brown, John Wilkes, Nat V. Kinney, the unanimous declaration of agreement by the remaining elders of the bald knobbers, represented herein by this mark, XX. Chapter 1. Ethics-Based Irregular Warfare Defined In the first section of this manual titled Peaceful Sedition, a set of definitions was presented explaining some of the wording used in this manual. Since this section of this manual is specifically dealing with ethics-based irregular warfare, the writers of this section have chosen to use that stated definition and expand on it slightly. Irregular warfare favors indirect and asymmetric approaches, so we will begin by establishing exactly what we mean by indirect and asymmetric. An open and direct confrontation with an enemy who possesses dramatically superior resources is never wise and is usually suicidal. Therefore, we must prefer small hit-and-move confrontations where we almost never fight an extended battle and we almost never confront more than one or two opponents at a time. Whenever possible, we should outnumber our opponents by a factor of two to one or even three to one. There are exceptions to this, for example, when a well-hidden rifleman can strike a high-value target and safely extract himself from the engagement, he could do so without a number advantage. Likewise, we must never attempt to hold or capture a geographic location of any kind, but we must remain fluid so that at any moment's notice, we can disperse into the vastness of the human tide. If possible, every confrontation should be planned and should be initiated on our terms. Targets should be carefully selected based on their priority and their vulnerability. Hard targets should be avoided at almost any cost. Our purpose and focus should always be on the long victory, and we must never allow short-sighted goals or temporary gains to lure us into believing that this war can be won by military means. Our primary purpose is to agitate and irritate our enemy, not defeat him. In a way, we are simply here to whip the money changers or knock over the tables. Our purpose is not to confront the might of the legions nor defeat the empire. The market will defeat the state. Our job is to erode our adversary's power, influence, and the individual's will to fight, while economics and the above-ground activists do the job of shifting market demand. Through self-discipline and mutual encouragement, we must maintain the style of fighting until the true powers behind the throne reveal themselves and become vulnerable. Then, and only then, we must shift our focus and descend upon them with single-minded dedication to, to decapitate the state through direct strikes against the true leadership. When that day comes, we must show no mercy. We must wear the edges off the guillotines and run the wood chippers' fuel tanks dry. The thing that differentiates our version of irregular warfare from terrorism and other government-supported guerrilla fighting is that we must always maintain the moral high ground by insisting all of our actions be ethics-based. In other words, no matter the outcome, 
our actions themselves must fall within the limits of property rights and defense as outlined elsewhere in this manual. Unlike our enemy, we must never strike the innocent for the purpose of moving the herd. We must never intentionally strike fear in the hearts of the innocent, and we must never intentionally sacrifice an innocent life for our cause. Our targets must always be specifically chosen and not the result of chance. Our strikes must be with precision, causing as little risk to bystanders as possible. For that reason, we should avoid using explosives as weapons as much as reasonably possible. And finally, every action must be for the purpose of disrupting the state, not to bring glory or recognition to any individual, nor even to the cause itself. 1-1. Stomping Sand Castles We shall not grow wiser until we learn that much of what we have done was very foolish. We wish it were not necessary to write this manual. We wish the bulk of humanity would not have allowed itself to become content in its own captivity, while forcing that captivity upon the rest of us. We wish those talented in the ways of self-defense and endowed with the independent warrior spirit had stood up and crushed the state and its supporters before the state had the opportunity to systematically dumb them down to the point that so few are left that can still think and fight. But we also know that no matter what each of us may wish, the reality of the situation is that a war is coming, and we can choose to fight it on our terms, or we can suffer the consequences of allowing the enemy of humanity to choose those terms and place this war upon us. Knowing that only the fool and the desperate fight on their enemy's terms, we choose to be neither the fool nor the desperate. We choose to plan, we choose to prepare, we choose to learn, and we choose to fight on our terms and on our schedule. Unfortunately, a portion of this manual must be dedicated to correcting the misled, reprimanding the ignorant, and mocking the foolish. Before we can show you how to arm yourself and how to fight a winning war, we must first destroy those precious sandcastles that so many have spent so much time and resources building. It would be nice if we had the talent, the time, and the media outlets to carefully walk everyone through this process without offending anyone, while at the same time being entertaining and making everyone feel good about themselves. But we don't have that luxury and neither do you. We have serious business ahead of us, and we need to clear out of our ranks those who can't handle the challenges that are coming towards us at an alarming speed. Preconceived notions, pride, machismo, and ego need to be set aside, and a realistic understanding of our resources, our strengths, our weaknesses, and our character need to be examined then you need to ask yourself if you are suited to step up and accept this challenge, or if you would prefer to adjust your chains and go back to enjoying government bread and circuses while passing the state on to your children. At least one of the sandcastles that we will be stomping will be American-centric. However, we will try to make this presentation broad enough that non-Americans can still find it useful. To clarify what is meant by that, too many Americans simply don't think of the rest of the world as even existing when they think about things like police brutality, property confiscations, and other forms of tyranny. When they think of the state, they only think of the D.C. government, rather than the bigger picture of the state as described in this manual. Somehow they have developed the mentality that Washington, D.C. is the center of their problem, and if a few politicians in that city were subdued or replaced, then we would all, be li then we would all live on the Big Rock Candy Mountain, where gumdrops grow on lollipop trees and trained monkeys ride unicorns, delivering ice cream sandwiches to all the happy children. Many Americans ignore other governments around the world that are every bit as evil as D.C., and that would be more than happy to rush in to fill any power vacuum that would develop if D.C. fell. They also tend to ignore the fact that governments around the world oppress the local populations, oftentimes with the aid of the D.C. government. 
and incredible numbers of people are ready to stand up to their governments today. They just like the knowledge of how to do it successfully. Many Americans don't understand that to be successful, the march to freedom must be a worldwide action by the friends of freedom in every land. We must tear down this beast everywhere he resides. We must give him no quarter, and he must find no sanctuary. Once this process begins, and as long as the fight for freedom continues, we cannot rest and we cannot let our enemy hide and regroup behind the borders that politicians have drawn on maps. Many Americans often ignore the local government employees that both enforce the will of D.C., while also daily enforcing the will of local tyrants, drunk with power, and hungry for glory. These same types of Americans often idolize the American military, made up of some 1.3 million of their own families and neighbors that carry out the orders of the D.C. government. Many willfully forget that when the D.C. government sends its Hellfire missiles to murder in faraway lands, and sends, it, sends its agents to rape and torture in hidden camps around the world, those Hellfire missiles are guided by young men and women taken right out of the American high schools and universities in their own neighborhoods. And those U.S. government agents who crushed the testicles of a small boy to punish his father are also recruited right out of the local American schools. These Americans, who often hate the D.C. government, choose not to realize that the most evil things that a government does happen because someone they know obeys orders, and most often does so on a local basis. Often these patriotic Americans deeply believe that their precious American military will stand with them and protect them from the D.C. government, ignoring the countless lessons from history that prove the exact opposite. They choose not to realize that their cousins and their neighbors, whether wearing the uniform of the D.C. legions, their state's national guard, or the uniform of the local police, have been trained and conditioned to not only obey orders, but to believe they are doing so for the greater good. This is why 19-year-old Ohio National Guardsmen were able to take aim and kill 19-year-old Kent State students in Ohio on May 4th of 1970. And this is how Massachusetts National Guardsmen were able to go house to house aiming automatic rifles at old people and children in Watertown, Massachusetts on April 19th of 2013 under the guise of a search for a teenager that, at the time, was only suspected of a crime. This is how a church in Waco, Texas was burned to the ground on April 19th of 1993 while children were contorting in pain from the chemicals being pumped into their storm shelter. And this is how American soldiers of the 12th Infantry Regiment and the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, commanded by Douglas MacArthur and supported by battle tanks commanded by George Patton, attacked and murdered retired and disabled American veterans and their families in Washington, D.C. on July 28th of 1930. Two. The sandcastle idea that when times turn bad, the U.S. military will disobey orders and come to the aid of the people of America is delusional at best and extremely dangerous under any circumstances. Those of us with our eyes open should avoid any kind of reliance upon people who insist upon believing such ridiculous myths and fantasies. Another sandcastle that needs to be stomped into the dirt is the notion that at some undeterminable point in the future, the D.C. government will cross an imagined, completely undefined line in the sand, and brave patriots will rally around the flag and restore the republic. If you once believed this at some time in the past, don't feel bad. Many of us have been fooled. If you still believe this nonsense today, stop reading this manual now and seek to educate yourself on the nature of the state because you are not mentally equipped for this fight. First, the D.C. government didn't suddenly turn bad. It was the bastard child of evil from the day it was conceived in the twisted minds of Hamilton, Washington, John Jay, Henry Knox, and other founding members of the Society of the Cincinnati. It was planned from its conception to eventually be a totalitarian government, and with the exception of a few stumbles along the way, 
It has faithfully followed that path ever since. Additionally, this process was clearly warned against and predicted at the time of the founders by the writers of the anti-federalist papers. In other words, the American government you see today is exactly what its designers wanted when they designed it. And the excuses given by American patriots not to burn it to the ground today are the same weak excuses they gave at every stage of its development since 1787. The Constitution of the United States of America was, and is, a document of enslavement, intended to fool the weak-minded while pacifying those who possess the moral fortitude and intelligence to stand up to tyranny. Second, if there actually was a magic line in the sand, it was crossed long before anyone reading this manual was born, and no one has risen up yet. Third and finally, the idea of patriots rising up is usually tied to the idea that another revolution is the answer to our problem. This is false, because revolution by definition is simply a turning around to arrive where we started, and we don't need to start this tyrannical process over again. We need to kill it once and forever. The next sandcastle that needs to be kicked into the air and scattered into the wind is the crazy notion that large sections of America, or perhaps states like Texas, Alaska, or New Hampshire, can break away or secede from the D.C. government, and freedom will somehow abound. Set aside the obvious problem of the aforementioned 1.3 million federal troops, the strongest army the world ha has ever seen, in the hands of the D.C. government, along with the ability and motivation to send death from the sky to visit every rebel state house, VFW lodge, and backyard barbecue where the terrorist rebels gather, and the idea becomes laughable at best. But add into the equation that the very idea of establishing a free state is self-contradictory. Then consider the contradiction of having a free society with government-established borders, and you enter the realm of collectivist hallucinatory delusions. Secession is the path to open geography-based war, the one type of warfare Washington, D.C. actually knows how to win. These notions of state secession are generally pushed by leaders who fantasize of being the next father of their country and would lead their followers right back into tyranny once the irresistible temptations of power take their natural course, assuming the D.C. government doesn't just round them up and exterminate them wholesale. Secession and revolution are the battleground the D.C. government is best suited for and clamors to fight. Give them that fight, and you secure their tyranny for generations to come. If you haven't already noticed, this manual is not written as a gentle persuasion to nudge you toward freedom. It's a hard primer to snap fresh troops into action so that they may stay alive, yet having the greatest possible impact against our enemy while remaining within the confines of the zero aggression principle. This manual is not all-encompassing. It is not an exhaustive textbook. It is not the definitive authority on anything, and it should only be an introduction to irregular warfare. In reality, this manual is nothing more than a drill instructor. In your face, screaming his lungs out so that you will not do something stupid that gets you or others like you killed. This manual is the glass of ice water down the back of your neck to wake you up from the hypnotic stupor your liberty leaders have seduced you into. This war is ours to win if we do it right, or ours to lose if we refuse to use wisdom or fail to keep our actions ethical. As much as the soft world wants you to compromise, get along, and unite... You must stand on principles, inflict justice, and scatter the collective into the dusts of history. Otherwise, you should return to the cotton fields and keep your head bowed low until the master decides he will let you have an extra chicken. Let's just pause and recap these points, as they are the cornerstone of this part of this manual and cannot be overemphasized. Washington, D.C., although a disgusting swamp of corruption and tyranny, is not alone in its crimes. Local tyrants and their servants enable the federal government to be what it is, and absent the federal overlords, 
those locals would become just as bad or worse than their D.C. masters. The myth that the U.S. military will come to the aid of the American people is counterfactual and a deadly mythology that history has disproven. Outside of the political borders of America lies a world on the verge of meaningless revolution that can be redirected to join us in a meaningful war against the true enemy of humanity, the state. But we must realize that there is no magic line in the sand somewhere in the future. Slavery is now upon us unless we stand up and free ourselves. We can fight the war our grandfathers failed to fight, or we can pass this slavery on to our grandchildren and accept the scorn we rightfully deserve. We must never accept the morphine of half measures, nor settle for a slightly more comfortable slavery under a local master. And we must not be baited into open confrontation with the strongest military the world has ever known, fighting an old-style geography-based conventional war. We must never attempt to take or hold a physical location or geographic area. We must never let our enemy decide the battlefield, not even once. We must fight unseen, undetected, without glory or recognition for our victories, and without sympathy for our losses. We must punch the enemy where he doesn't expect it and move before he can react. This is how we fight this beast, and this is how we kill him. The final sandcastle to be crushed is the so-called castle doctrine, perhaps the most precious castle in Western culture. Since pre-Roman times, a man's house was his castle, a place no tyrant or his lieutenants had the right to enter without permission. Even the vampires of European myth and legend could not breach the doorposts uninvited. This foundational property right was the basis of our conception of privacy and the idea that government agents needed a warrant to enter our homes. In today's world, the castle doctrine, no matter the platitudes, is de facto dead. If you, the individual, are brave or foolish enough to exert your right to protect your home and regulate who enters and under what circumstances that entry takes place, you may enter the land of the dead on the express train as SWAT teams cut you down or unmanned unseen aircraft rain death on you from above. A right ceases to be a right if it is impossible to enforce. If that sentence offends your sense of good and bad, then good for you. There is hope for you. Currently, this right of property is dead, but there are those of us who will see it resurrected. But before we can do so, we must first remove the power that has crushed property rights at every turn. We must kill the state, and the state lives so long as its enforcers and benefactors live. Therefore, seeing that we have been systematically attacked, we must defend ourselves and our property by killing the threat and those presenting said threat. But we cannot do it standing in our doorways. That battleground has been lost, and we must fall back and proverbially head for the hills, where our safety has always been. We must shift the battlefield to our advantage and become a fluid force that cannot be detected, cannot be pinned down, and cannot be defeated. The individual warrior must embrace ethics-based irregular warfare and learn the lesson of Buppert's Law, roughly stated, A mountainous people with a rifle culture cannot be defeated by conventional forces. That said, in many cases, the individual warrior may not have access to actual mountains for refuge, therefore many will have to adapt their methods according to circumstances. However, it is the opinion of the authors of this manual that a rifle culture is imperative to our victory. Keep in mind that in February of 2013, former Los Angeles co-proach Christopher Dorner, one lone actor proficient with a rifle, froze the entire law enforcement complex in Southern California in fear for nearly a month. One severely disturbed man had that kind of an impact with no support network and a horribly flawed approach and method. Consider what he could have done with a clear mind, a sound philosophy, a dependable partner, a network of sympathizers, and if he had not confined himself geographically. We have both the moral high ground and the logistics on our side if we fight an extended series of individual battles using wisdom and a disciplined, ethics-based, irregular warfare approach. We have found ourselves in this position not because we chose to be aggressed upon, but because we choose to stop the aggressor. Chapter 2. Camouflage is not a fashion statement. 
He is skillful in attack when his enemy does not know what to defend. He is skillful in defense when his enemy does not know what to attack. To the mall ninja, to the barroom hero, to the monster truck aficionado, to the connoisseur of low-calorie beer, and to the fly-fishing jig expert, camouflage is a fashion staple. To the individual warrior, camouflage should not be synonymous with woodland, tiger stripe, multicam, or tacam. Camouflage should rather be a word synonymous with phrases like fitting in, hide in plain sight, and honest officer, I didn't see anything or anyone unusual. Our enemy, the state, has the luxury of fighting wars of attrition. He has an endless supply of servants to call upon to pour into fields and down roads to their deaths. He adorns them in impressive uniforms and teaches them to mark in ridiculous, unnatural ways that everyone can see how blindly and fanatically they serve him. He teaches them to snap their heads from side to side, exaggerate their steps, and swing their arms like broken windmills. And they obey. No matter what absurd costumes the state requires, big furry hats, fringe-covered shoulders, or colorful, sparkly insignia, servants of the state strut themselves about showing their fervor for service while proudly whoring their dignity to their master. Watching a military parade should immediately put one in mind of the Paris fashion runways where pathetic brainless drones don ridiculous costumes and march about with a dead look in their eye for the perverted pleasure of a small group of rich women. Except in the case of the military parades, the brainless drones in costume kill on command and throw away their own lives for their rich political masters. And unlike those of the fashion models, the families of the military slaves take great pride when their sons and daughters die senselessly over a stretch of sand or a bombed-out hill. Or worse yet, the broken slaves, no longer useful to the politicians, come home with war-ravished bodies and minds and are relegated to live out their miserable existence in homeless shelters or under a bridge near a trash dumpster where they can find some morsel to eat. Even in this shameful condition, the burned-out souls will often continue wearing some tattered, camo-painted remnant of their costume. This is how the state treats its most faithful slaves. And thus we see our enemies, not the broken slaves, but the men and women who use the state to destroy lives, including destroying their own slaves. We must not use people like this, nor should we allow ourselves to be used like this. The individual warrior is a rare commodity that must be respected and cherished. If victory is to be obtained, it will be through each individual warrior realizing that his or her strength doesn't lie in the collective power of waves of dead soldiers, but in the success of staying alive, of moving without being observed, and of striking and vanishing without being remembered. This is the power of camouflage, to appear so much a part of the scenery that no one notices that you are there, and that no one notices when you leave. In modern first world irregular warfare, this is not done by breaking light and shadow patterns and mimicking leaves or grass. It's done by looking and acting like you should be where you are. We will stay alive, and we will defeat the state only when we pick our battle, when we strike where the enemy is not guarding, and when we present our enemy with no way to strike us back. In frustration, the state will punish the innocent, and that will create even more of us to strike him again. With more careful strikes against the state, the state will commit more resources to swinging at our shadows. Simple mathematics teaches us that a single bullet costs only costs us a few small coins. But governments must respond with mountains of cash and dramatic oppression of the innocent. As that oppression rises, faith in the state shrinks. This is our part in the process that leads to the death of our enemy, the state. Chapter 3. Justification and Target Acquisition Quote, they who employ force by proxy are as much responsible for that force as though they employed it themselves. Close quote. Herbert Spencer. If you're reading this, then it shouldn't be necessary to go to great lengths or to spend a lot of energy convincing you that preemptive self-defense is always the wisest form of self-defense. Also, it shouldn't be necessary to justify the concept of engaging in irregular warfare with proven aggressors like the individual violent police, specific decision-makers, 
or military actors who follow orders and kill on command. But the difficult thing about government is that by its very design, it's a massive structure created to shift the blame to so many hands that no one can be held responsible. This collectivist notion is perhaps best displayed in the story of the death of Julius Caesar, where each senator took a turn stabbing Caesar so that no one person could be guilty of the assassination. Of course, this only works as a collectivist argument. The moment you introduce individual accountability, the collectivist argument vanishes like a shadow in sunlight. So how do we determine the level of responsibility of each statist, and how do we determine what our response to each of those statists should be once we accept our role as individual warriors engaging in irregular warfare? That can be a question of extreme complexity if we allow it to be, but it's simply not necessary to allow it to be complex if we narrow our fight to targets where no question is present. In other words, don't allow yourself to be caught up in such a target-rich environment that you fail to see the obvious shots. Think of the lion in the field with a thousand gazelle. Once he reveals himself, they will all bolt, and his field of vision will be filled with moving shapes and bouncing targets. The wise lion doesn't just go for whichever gazelle jumps, because the moment they run, none of them will be catchable. The wise lion picks out one easy shot. He takes his time. He prepares. He knows a wasted attempt is wasted energy, and he knows he can't afford wasted energy. Failed hunts mean starvation. So he fixes his eyes on one target, and when the moment happens, he refuses to be distracted. For the individual warrior, the state provides such a target-rich environment that it's easy to be distracted. It's easy to chase philosophical rabbits down never-ending rabbit holes, debating about which cops are good and which are bad, and if the mailman is robbing you through taxation, and if the parking enforcement officer has crossed some line. Or you can stop, clear your mind, focus, and do your job. There are plenty of violent cops with incredibly horrible records, who have been documented and filmed beating homeless people for no reason, and killing anyone who crosses them. And there are plenty of bureaucrats enabling and protecting those violent cops. We don't need to attack a collective any more than we need to be distracted by that collective. We need to carefully do our homework, review our decisions with a verifiable process, and take the needed actions to secure our freedom. As we pick the fruit that is ripe, the tree will see to it that more fruit ripens in its time. 3-1. Pause and review. Let's pause for a moment and review a line you just read. We need to, one, carefully do our homework, two, review our decisions with a verifiable process, and three, take the needed actions to secure our freedom. These three points are critical. 3-1.1 Do your homework. The first thing to keep in mind is that we are not concerned about justifying our actions to a government court. If it comes to that, we are sunk. In the minds of the statists, we're already criminals just for discussing these things, much more so for acting on them. Our concern should primarily be what is right and what is wrong. This is why the statement was made earlier that we should concentrate on picking the fruit that is ripe. We shouldn't take action against any target where there is doubt of guilt. We should take our time, research accusations, and be slow to make our judgment. The exception being a situation where time is pressing and the target is actively a serious threat to the innocent. But under normal circumstances, where we have time to rely on the investigative process, the individual warriors can work with trusted non-combatant members of the underground. Activity like gathering video evidence of crimes, hacking personal files, gathering a private data like addresses, shopping habits, and any other information that will help the underground build a fair and honest profile of the accused target, and the activities in his private life, would be tremendously helpful. This process is especially important for the less obvious targets like bureaucrats, key corporate enablers, and even drone operators who do their murdering behind the cloak of government secrecy. 3-1.2 Review decisions with a verifiable process 
again, assuming the target is not an intermediate and serious threat to the innocent, then we can consider two options. The first being the best practice, and the second being a less desirable practice that should only be used when absolutely necessary. The best practice would be a reviewable collecting and documenting of the accusations, followed by a specific stating of the charges, then followed by a review by at least three reliable parties. Finally, either a unanimous decision of the three reliable parties, or a delay until a unanimous decision can be agreed upon. If a unanimous decision is not directly forthcoming, that target should be dropped from consideration and the next target up for review should be considered. This process could be done both privately and secretly, while the overall propos can be recorded in the Bitcoin blockchain for later review and public scrutiny. It would cost a very small amount of Bitcoin to make a transaction with an encrypted transcript embedded in the transaction, so that after the fact, if the results of the trial needed to be reviewed, the encryption key could be released or even shared on a need-to-know basis, and either open to the public, or it could remain locked if no one challenged the trial or the process. The less desirable practice would be a direct private conversation between two or three individual warriors working together as a team, and if an agreement is made as to the target's guilt, then the team does what they need to do. Circumstances may dictate that this process is the only one available. That would be unfortunate, but sometimes a perfect world is simply not available. 3-1.3 Taking Action In a perfect world, we would make our strike as the target is attacking a victim. A public display such as this could work in our favor, but if botched, or if there is some public question as to the guilt of the target, then this could become a publicity nightmare. Also, if you consider the structure of the state, the obvious killers wear police uniforms and usually only kill one at a time. But the real murderers in government kill dozens or even thousands with a few words or the stroke of a pen on paper. The best practice is a quiet, preferably private solution when the target is alone and it can be made to look like an accident or a suicide or the target can simply vanish. The longer the individual warriors are working without being seen or even suspected of existing, the better we are doing our job. In this process, we can take a lesson from the CIA and other such crime syndicates that operate in the shadows. Always remember, we are not in this for the gore or the glory. We're in this to free the world of those who relish in gore and glory. We must always guard that we don't become what we fight. One method that may be helpful would be for a strike team to come together for a specific job within a specific time frame. Then once the event is done, the team could disband and return to normal life with no team contact until a preset time. With enough teams working in rotation, the burden of such actions can be lightened and it can be harder for our enemy to discover the functioning of our networks. 3-2. Target Acquisition Those that are generally thought of as the powerful in the world are the politicians, But this is part of the illusion of government. When we look at politicians, we are, as it were, looking at the grass on a hill. The grass is not the hill, and in fact, the grass adds very little to the hill. But it's what we see. Like grass, politicians are seasonal. They sprout up quickly, put on a show, and then vanish into the soil, their demise bringing life to the next seasonal explosion of drama. As the new generation of politicians reach for the sky... Politicians hold a temporary but obvious position that, no matter how it appears, has very little power. If you dig deeper into the hill, you will find the grass is rooted in the soil, and the soil provides the nutrients that determine if the grass lives or dies. The soil is critical to the dramatic performance of the grass, so in that sense the soil, or better stated, the dirt in our metaphorical hill, is the massive network of unelected bureaucrats, party bosses, lobbyists, and the permanent understructure of men and women that do the actual running of the day-to-day functions of government. The grass comes and goes, but bureaucracy stays. These people, the dirt of governments, do the actual developing of the policies and laws. They hand down the regulations, they introduce the politicians to the right lobbyist, to the right donor, and to the right power people in corporations and banks. These people determine when, where, and how tall the grass grows. And yet, the dirt is not the hill. 
The hill is in reality the rocks that thrust up from the valley floor. The corporate giants and the banking cartels are the rocks that are almost unmovable. The rocks determine if there is or is not a hill. The rocks are the true power. Everything else is on the surface protecting the rocks from exposure to the elements. So long as the rocks remain covered, they don't erode and the hill lives on. Take away the dirt and the grass vanishes and the rocks begin to crumble and weather away. If politicians are like the grass on a hill, police are like the annoying insects that crawl all over the surface of that hill. Watching a video of a violent cop beating a pregnant woman, kicking her stomach, and stomping on her face should infuriate any sensible person. Seeing the video of the handicapped man in Florida handcuffed to a wheelchair while police walk by and casually pepper spray his face until he asphyxiates and dies should be a source of outrage and should make anyone want to act against these brutal murderers. Studying the case of Kelly Thomas, the disabled man beaten to death by Manuel Ramos, Jay Cicinelli, and Joseph Wolf who wore the uniforms of the Fullerton, California Police Department on the night of July 5th of 2011, should fill your heart with both pity and rage. But the uncomfortable fact of the situation is that if there were a magic trigger we could pull that would cause every single violent murderous cop in the world to suddenly drop dead, the actual power brokers of the state would hardly blink, as they simply hired another hive of violent, ego-driven, hate-filled idiots to replace the dead ones. Unfortunately, there is an endless sea of angry morons who would just love to have a legal excuse to beat weak people while wearing a uniform and collecting a fat paycheck. So as temporarily gratifying as it may be, simply pulling that magic trigger on a world of violent cops won't stop the process that makes them. It does little more than crushing a few ants to stop an infestation. That's not to say that given the opportunity to stop them, murderous scum should be allowed to continue their rampage upon the defenseless. Stopping the senseless beatings and killings of the innocent is one job of the individual warrior, assuming he can do so safely without exposing himself or his network. But the better target is the police chief who places the violent cop in that position and then publicly defends him when he does his evil deeds. Yet a better target still is the politician who appoints the chief, or the even higher power broker who uses his influence to say who the next mayor, senator, or president will be. The deeper you dig into the darkness, the more important and more difficult the target becomes. So violent, dangerous police are easy targets that deserve our attention. But dealing with them won't solve our problem. As much as we would like to spend our time crushing bugs, those bugs are simply a symptom of the problem of the hill. We must expose the rock so that the forces of nature can follow its course. One thing to keep in mind is that evil doesn't look the way the state has taught you to expect evil to appear. When you look through the eyepiece of a scope, you will not find Adolf Hitler or Hannibal Lecter. You will find someone who looks very much like you. You won't see that person as he or she kicks in a door and throws a flashbang into the crib of a baby. You won't see them as they torture and torment a prisoner. And you won't see them as they authorize a Hellfire missile strike on a family during a wedding. You will be more likely to see them as they sit in traffic listening to morning radio or as they open their mailbox. This is the reason fighting and killing the state is so difficult, because it usually doesn't appear as it really is. The people who are most important to keeping the state alive are the ones we have almost no chance of reaching. And most of the ones we can easily reach don't really matter to the continuation of the state, other than the untouchable few at the tops of the banking cartels and corporate consortiums to make the state possible. The most important targets that can actually make an impact in the war in this war are the people referred to by Michael Glennon in National Security and Double Government as the Trimanite Network. According to Glennon, quote, Trimanites can have no real discussions with family or friends about war because nearly all of their work is classified. They hold multiple compartmented clearances. Their offices are located in the buildings as expensive real estate, the Pentagon's E-ring the CIA's seventh floor, the State Department's seventh floor. Keypads lock their doors. Next to their desks are a safe and two computers, one unclassified and the other classified. Down the hall is a CSCIF-167 where the most sensitive briefings take place. 
They speak in acronyms and code words the public has never heard of, and God and the FBI willing never will hear. Close quote. Finding and touching key members of this Trumanite network will be difficult because the camouflage they wear is the best kind of camouflage. They are a subset of the most abundant part of government, and as such, they are almost impossible to individually spot and verify simply because there are so many who basically appear like and work at similar locations as non-targets and neutrals. Here again we see how important the role of the non-combatant underground can be in helping that the discovery and exposure of the individuals of the Trumanite network. However, once discovered, we must ask if it's worth the risk of targeting an individual. The true answer to that question is that it is rarely worth the investment and risk to target them. There are exceptions that should be targeted as soon as possible, but most are no more important to the state than the violent police mentioned earlier. Most will be replaced by another Trumanite before they can assume room temperature, and investing that much work and risk into a target that will be instantly replaced is not wise. We should always do a cost-benefit analysis when selecting targets. And again, the non-combatant underground can play a critical role in that process. We'll need to have a good idea of what they can do, who they work for and with, can they be easily replaced, and can we reach them with alternative methods better suited to our friend at Saboteur's network. After all, a powerful murderous bureaucrat who is in the middle of a massive mental breakdown due to a carefully crafted gaslight operation is more valuable to us than a simple dead body. Once again, when you look through that eyepiece and see a Trumanite, they won't look like Adolf Hitler or Hannibal Lecter, but just keep in mind that their words and actions rain death upon the innocent, while the worst part of their day is sitting in traffic trying to escape the Beltway to get to their McMansion in the suburbs. Before you feel sorry for that State Department slug, do a start page image search of the children they murdered this week. Then realize that if no one steps up and stops them, they will kill by proxy again and again and again. However, always remember how these people reacted when Michael Hastings exposed one of them to the public while planning to expose more. Now imagine what the reaction would be if we targeted six Trumanites in one day. If you think the LAPD went nuts when Dorner killed a few cop roaches, you won't believe how the dirt on the hill in D.C. will react when Uriks start dropping in Mordor, and the same goes in every other capital city around the world. 3-3 Non-human targets. Garnering less immediate reaction from governments, but possibly having a greater long-term effect, will be the targeting of non-humans, including both the physical infrastructure and the corporate supports of the state. In these operations, the individual warriors can work hand-in-hand with trusted non-combatant members of the underground. Ideally, there should be friend saboteurs working with hackers and other members of the underground to expose flaws in corporate security and weaknesses in key places like the communications infrastructure and the electrical grids. 3-3.1, Targeting Infrastructure. The problem with targeting infrastructure is that it's a blade that cuts in all directions. In one sense, much of the faith the general public holds in the state rests upon its ability to provide roads, electricity, public water and sewer, and other such services. If they appear to slowly break down and the state is shown incapable or unwilling to keep them functional, then faith in the state is eroded. However, if terrorists can be blamed for power outages and system failures, the state can use the outages to increase tyranny and oppression. Knowing this, government agents have been documented over and over attacking their own citizenry and infrastructure for the express purpose of using these attacks as an excuse to gain more power over the people. Thus, we have the phrase false flag event to describe such actions. Yet again, that oppression gives rise to more resistance, especially when the above-ground activists focus on the rise of oppression and show that the terrorism is just an excuse of the state to produce more tyranny. Ideally, if the terrorism that actually causes the outages can be linked to government agents, it can be a propaganda victory for the forces of liberty, or it can just lead to more oppression. That means any strike against infrastructure is a delicate dance between success and failure, depending on so many variables that no one can calculate a guaranteed outcome. Of course, calculation problems never stop government actors from barging ahead. Perhaps the perfect solution would be to stage a false flag event and frame government agents for the attack. Or even better, to bait a government agent to commit and bungle a false flag so that it could be exposed by such as such by the above-ground activists. That sounds almost impossible, but it could be done if it would truly be a grand accomplishment. 
FBI agents do the equivalent of this all the time in America as they lure some mentally challenged, desperate Muslim or militia member into a cockamamie plot that the FBI then uses as an excuse to arrest more Muslims or militia members. The best practice when it comes to a direct strike on infrastructure may be to coordinate the timing with some other event. The mainstream media is not good at following more than one major developing story, so an infrastructure failure could be used to distract coverage from some other event or the other way around. 3-3.2 Targeting Crony Corporations Many avid hunters dream of taking a safari, hunting the big game, taking down an African Cape buffalo, or an Alaskan grizzly bear. Likewise, the fishermen may have dreams of bounding across Atlantic waves on a fishing boat with an 800-pound blue marlin on hook. It all sounds very romantic and brings to mind great manly men of the past like Ernest Hemingway or John Huston, sucking down Cohiba cigars while swirling cognac. The reality of hunting and fishing is much different when you do it to stay alive. Survival and sustenance hunting and fishing typically don't depend on big game, and the further you are from drama and conflict, the better chance you have of feeding the mouths that depend on your success. For this reason, survival and sustenance hunting and fishing are more likely to focus on rabbits, squirrels, minnows, and catfish than any big game. This is hunting from necessity, not entertainment. The same is true when we think of fighting the state by taking on the corporate wing of the dragon. We may all dream of sinking our lands deep in the heart of the military-industrial complex or the banking cartels by striking some famous member of the Rothschild or Rockefeller families or bagging a descendant of the house of saxe coburg and Gotha. But we must live in the real world where even the mention of their wealth and power make people think you're crazy. They are the untouchables, and it's pure suicide to chase them. No, we are fighting for survival and sustenance. Someday when the state is in its death throes, we will hunt the big game. But today, while the state is relatively healthy, we must hunt that which can be taken. In 2014, a documentary by Tonhe Hessen Sechi was released titled Drone. That film contains an interview with a man named Andy Von Flatow, founder of the government surveillance drone supplier in situ. Headquartered in Bingen, Washington, USA, in situ was a small company that was eventually absorbed by its longtime partner, Boeing. In that brief interview, Von Flatow makes several disturbing statements, but topping it off, he brags, war is an opportunity to do business. This little slice of truth shows the nature of the people who facilitate the wholesale slaughter of humans for profit and power. Echoing what Major General Smedley Butler said in his 1935 book titled War's a Racket, Von Flatow proudly admits his guilt in the crimes Butler described, and Smedley Butler was a man who knew about war. By the end of his career, Butler had received 19 medals, five for heroism. He received the Medal of Honor twice, was one of only three Americans to be awarded both the Marine Corps Brevet Medal and the Medal of Honor, and was the only Marine ever to be awarded the Brevet Model and two Medals of Honor, all for separate actions. Von Flotow has also made his contribution to war, but has made a fortune in the process, so targeting him now would be like the, uh, that old saying, why close the barn door after the horse is done run off? But a lesson can be learned from the man in the small company he founded. When Von Flotow founded in Sutu, the focus of the company was in the development of unmanned weather reconnaissance vehicles. It wasn't until 2003 when Von Flotow and in Sutu shifted to military applications. The time to slam the barn door on Von Flotow and in Sutu would have been between the shift to militarism in 2003 and in Sutu being swallowed by Boeing around 2008. The idea of a corporation sharing the guilt of war with governments is hard for some people to accept until they make the whole connection between governments, the banking cartels, and the military-industrial complex. Some will say that what the corporations do in supplying governments their military contracts is no different than what the rum manufacturer does in selling rum. It's not the rum maker's fault when someone drinks rum, drives their car, and kills someone. But has Bacardi Limited ever sent company representatives into Alcoholics Anonymous meetings with rum samples? Do Bacardi sales representatives get a bonus in their wages based on increases in drunk driving death statistics? We know from a wide variety of inside sources, including former U.S. presidents, former high-ranking military officers, and former leaders in the corporate world, that select corporations directly lobby for war in a wide range of ways. Then there's the problem of choice and intent. 
As Kant teaches us, intent is the basis of judging an action. It's almost never the case that a man buys a bottle of rum with the full intent and purpose of getting drunk and killing someone. That's not to say the drunk should be excused for his actions and his poor choices, but he never intended to kill, and Bacardi didn't sell him the rum knowing ahead of time that he would kill. After all, the vast majority of rum drinkers never kill anyone. However, the modern weapons of war are sold to governments exclusively, knowing full and well how they will be used. When Raytheon developed millimeter or wave source weapons, it wasn't so people could relax on a beach and enjoy a sunset. It was so government agents could use the equivalent of a cattle prod to move the human herds and to single out individuals for direct punishment or death. Coupled with the fact that the decision makers in these corporations are the very same people who place the politicians in their offices, and as we have seen, the corporation decision makers know that war is an opportunity to do business. Therefore, we can establish both choice and intent when we judge the corporate leaders that not only supply the means of war, but encourage the decision to engage in those wars. Now let's consider one more way Bacardi's rum sales to the public are different from Raytheon's relationship to governments. Setting aside whatever questionable business practices Bacardi Limited may or may not be guilty of, Bacardi's primary product is produced and consumed through voluntary market interactions with the general public. When Raytheon develops a product for warfare, even the original research funding is provided by governments and originally stolen from people through taxation. So Bacardi primarily depends on voluntary market activity, while Raytheon depends on taxation and influence buying. Without dedicating a whole paragraph to the international banking cartel, suffice to say, the military-industrial complex and governments who engage in war never act without the involvement of the banking elite. So those corporate and banking executives who profit from war and death by guiding governments into war for the purposes of profits are guilty of the murder that comes from their wars, Yet the financial burden of those wars are involuntarily carried on the backs of taxpayers. Therefore, we see that war is a racket, and that the racketeers are the corporate and banking executives, the politicians, and the Trumanites that profit from wars, whereas the victims of war are the dead on all sides, and the taxpayers who are forced to pay for all of it. Bacardi Limited, as we have shown, carries no such burden of guilt. Just like Bacardi Limited is used only as an example here, so is Raytheon just one example of the military-industrial complex. And it's worth noting in the metaphor of the hunter, Raytheon is not an easy catch like a rabbit, a squirrel, or a catfish, but they are not a bull elephant either. Raytheon is simply one scale on the dragon we call the state. Chapter 4. Committees of Vigilance. 4-1. Vigilante Justice. Few things have been systematically and intentionally demonized more than vigilante justice, and leading that witch hunt for the last century has been the Hollywood entertainment industry. At the height of Hollywood cowboy movies during the mid-20th century, the American entertainment industry was almost incapable of producing anything referencing the Old West that didn't feature either a demonization of stateless wild Indians on a murderous rampage with the helpless settlers saved by the military, or a lynch mob attempting to hang some innocent man with a brave sheriff saving the day. This Wild West narrative permeated not only motion pictures and television, but almost every work of fiction about the West written during the 20th century. This simple fact should cause any free-thinking person to ask why there would be such uniform condemnation of anything. Any person who owns their own mind should immediately suspect any narrative that is so one-sided, so dramatically portrayed, and pushed so heavily by the same people who support the state at every turn, including justifying and glorifying the horrors of war. Consider the 20th century Hollywood version of any portrayal of any historical event, and consider their amazing propensity to get almost every detail wrong, and you begin to see that something is rotten in Hollywood's universal condemnation of vigilantism. When a free-thinking person realizes propaganda on such a grand scale, that person should immediately ask why so much effort has been, exper- has been expended on that one topic. But of course we know the reason. Vigilante justice is the single most dangerous thing the state faces. To start with, the state claims a monopoly on justice, but vigilante justice is the only way to achieve true justice. The alternative to vigilante justice is the perverted version of justice that the state supplies. And what kind 
of a sick and twisted society it produces. This is the reason that every time the state has expanded and engulfed stateless societies such as pre-Cromwell Celtic Christian Ireland, pre-English Invasion Scotland, pre-English Australia, native North America excluding the Mesoamerican empires, pre-1800 Scot-Irish Appalachia, the American West prior to the post-Civil War expansion of the state, and the Zomia, Zomia of upland Southeast Asia, the very first thing the state does is to outlaw vigilante justice and inflict its monopoly of state justice. This is the situation in which we find ourselves today. The state has systematically denied justice while demonizing aspects of true justice. It has, through its puppets in the media, the schools and the clergy, taught that revenge is uncivilized and barbaric or even sinful. Justice is redefined as whatever the current government decides in each individual case. Recompense is paid to the government and almost never to the victim. The government, not the victim, dictates the punishment, and then the government imprisons and punishes the accused perpetrator behind closed doors and out of public sight. The government, through immoral taxation, forces victims and innocent bystanders to pay for the incarceration process, all the time making false assurances of safety and security. Then it arbitrarily releases criminals back into society that are often more violent and dangerous than when they were first incarcerated. And finally, in desperation, as its failures become more and more obvious, governments begin redefining crime so that almost any normal peaceful activity can be criminalized and punished. And yet people fear vigilante justice. It would be comical if it weren't so tragic. If we understand that everything we've been taught about vigilante justice is false, and we know the state is incapable of producing justice while it attempts to enforce its monopoly control to prevent vigilante justice, logically we should know that we need to revisit what we believe about justice. True justice has a number of components. Among these are assurance, knowing that this perpetrator will never do this crime to this victim again, recompense, a return of or a monetary compensation for what was stolen or damaged, Revenge, personally inflicting or witnessing the infliction of suffering upon the perpetrator above and beyond the original damages for the purpose of easing the trauma of the victim and to show the perpetrator and the community that this behavior is unacceptable. Scholars who study this topic have endlessly discussed how these systems have functioned for extended periods without government interference. They've also shown that stateless societies very quickly develop systems to ensure true justice, but until now, one thing has been missing from the conversation. That is the failure of non-state justice systems to defend people from the crime gangs that operate governments. When stateless people are invaded by a government, those people respond in several ways. But the one thing we don't see is vigilante groups treating government employees and state actors as the criminal gangs that they are. This is something we can address. We simply begin forming committees of vigilance and, one at a time on local levels, we begin prosecuting those who act on behalf of the international crime gang known as the state. We start with the ones we can reach. We touch those who can be touched. We get better each time we act, and we weaken the state with every small strike. Eventually, we can touch those who are out of reach before, and at some point we reach the untouchables. 4-2. Forming Committees of Vigilance. A committee of vigilance should be a secret unit formed of like-minded friends made up of whatever combination of dedicated underground activists you have available. The committee should concern itself with one thing. Justice. What sports teams are doing or how the weather has been can be discussed anywhere with anyone, but when a committee of vigilance meets, they should do so with one purpose and one purpose only. To seek and deliver justice. When individual members of a vigilance committee are found to constantly bring up outside issues or distractions, that member should be excluded from the meetings. Natural leaders will likely develop, but anyone who begins to shift the focus of the committee to self-glorification should be excluded from the meetings. If possible, the committee should be made up of individual warriors and trusted non-combatant members of the underground, with the individual warriors acting as the enforcement wing. A committee doesn't have to include an enforcement wing, but without one, it becomes an exercise in academics. That isn't nece that's not necessarily a bad thing if the committee can eventually develop an enforcement wing. In that way, a committee can be a kind of teaching opportunity for activists who feel the need to move into the individual warrior classification. Once the local committee 
connects with a network of vigilance committees. Members of the enforcement wing or wings can be shared, as their specialties may be unique. A committee of vigilance doesn't include every underground activist in an area unless you have a serious shortage of activists. The committee should be very selective of who is allowed in and who they communicate with on committee business outside of the committee. Whenever possible, a committee should seek to interact with other committees, forming a distributed network, ideally spreading globally. It shouldn't be a hard rule to exclude above-ground activists. However, everyone involved in a committee of vigilance should clearly understand the risks involved. Authoritarians in every level of the state will, as soon as they are aware of us, begin referring to us as terrorists. This is the reason such an emphasis on security should be employed. The primary purpose of a committee of vigilance should be to develop target lists, hold target review hearings, do target risk benefit analysis, and make final decisions on the fate of the target, then communicate that decision to the enforcement wing. The secondary purpose of a committee of vigilance should be to discuss potential new members of the underground, develop trust lists and contact lists, both to be kept encrypted and secured, and expand network connections. Additionally, every member of a committee of vigilance should have a clear understanding of the concept of mission creep, and the committee should be constantly self-examining to assure that mission creep doesn't slip into your activities. Chapter 5. Funding. Compared to funding a state-based justice system, vigilante justice is practically free and usually funds itself. Again, stateless societies tend to solve problems like funding on their own very quickly. However, getting a committee of vigilance started and functional under the current circumstances will cost a small amount of money. That fact should not prevent us from moving ahead in the process. Local groups can move as slow as they need to so long as they are moving in the right direction. Always remember we must keep our goal as winning the long fight, not solving an immediate issue. Moving slowly but directly towards a goal is better than moving rapidly in the wrong direction. So a lack of funding should never be an excuse to sit idly by doing nothing. Be creative and do what you can do with the resources you have. That said, since we know that war is paid for through the stolen money that governments extract from the working masses, we then know that the profits of war are filthy lucre and are not the rightful property of those corporations, bankers, executives, politicians, and Trumanites who possess them. So let's face the facts. The filthy lucre of the state lies in abundance for those brave enough to walk into the dragon's lair and take it. But walking out of that lair with the gold requires more than bravery. 5.1. Filthy Lucre Filthy Lucre Defined as money gained in a dishonest or dishonorable way. That's the simple yet accurate definition of filthy lucre. The money itself takes on no magical residue of its ill-gotten past. Money is inanimate and is not to blame for human actions. Therefore, it can carry with it no guilt for past misdeeds. Stolen money in the possession of thieves, robbers, crony corporations, crony executives, crony bankers, politicians, and other such scum is unowned property and available for rightful homesteading. Additionally, since these crime gang members are routinely guilty of either direct aggression on the innocent or are guilty of aggression through proxy, none of the property they have come to possess under any circumstances protected by natural rights theory and is therefore rightfully unowned. It's part of the duty of a properly functioning justice system to acquire such funds and utilize those funds to accomplish the three aspects of justice listed above, namely assurance, recompense, and revenge. Starting with assurance, we cannot assure victims that the robbery won't continue so long as the crime gang members known as the state continues to function. So one of our priorities in dealing with filthy lucre should be to safely extract as much as possible from the criminals and repurpose it for our cause of ending the state. Methods of liberating the filthy lucre of the state will vary widely according to the skill levels of activists and the opportunities presented in our interaction with state actors. However, it is imperative that we maintain our principles. We cannot terrorize the innocent, and the families of state actors are not guilty by default. We must be surgical and precise in our handling of state actors, and whenever possible, we should stay anonymous and keep the purpose of our cause hidden for as long as possible. Chapter 6. Winning. The Lesson of Algeria. Algeria was invaded, then violently and mercilessly conquered by France in the 1830s. For over 100 years, Algeria was a military colony where land was stolen from its traditional owners and handed out to waves of European immigrants, who were then favored by the French legal system over the indigenous Muslim and Jewish Algerians. All that changed on November 1st of 1954, when guerrilla fighters began a war that lasted until France was humiliated and forced to resign in 1962. 
During that brief war from 1954 until 1962, France was so devastated that France itself almost erupted in a civil war. And all of this was made possible by a small group of irregular warriors called the National Liberation Front. By 1960, the French force in Algeria was in excess of 300,000 highly trained combat troops, supplied with the most modern equipment. At its peak of power during the war, the National Liberation Front numbered something less than 30,000 fighters, poorly equipped with only light weapons when they had weapons at all. At one point in the city of Algiers, the clandestine warfare organization was comprised of approximately 1,200 armed men and 4,500 persons unarmed. Yet the Algerians soundly defeated the French. They did so by using strike-and-run tactics, by avoiding open conflict, and by hiding in plain sight. At one point, a major leader of the NLF had his operation headquarters only a few hundred meters from a French stronghold in Algiers. The French could neither see nor understand their enemy, so the French never had a chance. As the respected French authority on the Algerian war and on irregular warfare, Roger Twin Quare stated, quote, We know that the sia quea non of victory in modern warfare is the unconditional support of a population. According to Mao Zedong, it is as essential to the combatant as water to the fish. Such support should be spontaneous, although that is quite rare and probably a temporary condition. If it doesn't exist, it must be secured by every possible means, the most effective of which is terrorism, close quote. When Trinquer speaks of terrorism, he is speaking of a situation where local fighters harass both authority and the civilian population, and at the same time, the authority is unable to maintain security for the population. So, the population both fears the terrorism and hate the authority for failing to provide security. In our version of ethics-based irregular warfare, the attacks would be on authoritarian individuals and on infrastructure, but never directly on the civilian population. As attacks increase in number and effectiveness, the population more and more will blame authorities while authorities have no one to crack down on except the innocent civilian population. Reading Roger Trinquere's analysis of the Algerian war and his assessments of the French-Indochina war are fascinating and informative, but not completely applicable to our purposes. The two assumptions of authoritarians in regards to warfare is that either geography must be controlled or populations must be controlled with the goal to control both. We must reject this. We can never attempt to control either. Our path to victory and the death of the state must rely upon our practice of never directly engaging the might of the state while always respecting the lives and property of the civilian population. Whenever possible, we should avoid terrorizing the public or inciting panic in any way. Whenever our target must be a public one, that target should be hated. Otherwise, don't let it look like a hit. We must never incite sympathy for the devil. The final lesson of Algeria is the lesson of every revolution throughout history. When the French abandoned Algeria, the old faraway tyrant was replaced by a new local tyrant, and the cycle of the state continued. This is what revolutions always produce. Therefore, we must not engage in revolution. We must strike, we must agitate, we must provoke, but mostly we must provide the framework for the above-ground network to teach and advertise a better option than the slavery of the state until the day that the market demand shifts and people stop wanting the state. Chapter 9. Meet Tom Smith. Tom works at the Pentagon, and Tom loves his job. Last month, he moved to a window office that looks out toward the lagoon so he can watch the boats coming in and out of the marina. It took Tom 18 years to get where he is, and he knows he deserves this job. Tom is a nice place out in Warrington. It's a hard hour drive each way without traffic, and there's always traffic, but it's worth it to get his family out of the beltway into a nice area out in the country. Tom makes the sacrifice for his kids, and he feels good about that. Tom's wife, Betty, volunteers at the kids' school, so most mornings Tom and Betty load the kids in the car and they all ride together. It's just down the street on the way to Lee Highway. Betty's mother comes by the school in the afternoon and gives them a ride home. It's nice to have family nearby. Most mornings Tom goes down Fouquier Road, drops the wife and kids at the LDS Church School, and then stops down the street at the Exxon to fill up before hitting the Lee Highway and heading into the grind. Sometimes Tom cheats, but doesn't tell Betty. There's a donut place just around the corner, and sometimes Tom slips over and grabs a coffee and an apple fritter. The truth is, Tom doesn't cheat sometimes. Tom cheats and gets a coffee and a fritter every Friday, 
but Tom feels like he has earned it. Tom has worked hard and made sacrifices to get where he is and to achieve this life he's made for himself. One Friday morning, as Tom pulled into the donut place, he saw the drive-thru was backed up with some kind of utility truck that clearly shouldn't have tried to go through the drive-thru. No problem, Tom just nosed into one of the open parking spaces and hopped out of his car. Then everything in Tom's world changed. He hadn't seen it before, but a white utility van was right at his rear bumper and the slide door was opening. Tom felt a heavy hand on his left shoulder and another strong hand grabbed his right arm. Come with me, Mr. Smith. We have some questions. This won't take but a moment, and you'll be free to go on your way. The van door finished opening, and a man stepped out. No problems now, Mr. Smith. This can be quick and easy, and you can go on to work. In a flash, they were all in the van, and the door was closed. There were more men inside. I apologize, sir, but this is absolutely necessary, I can assure you, said one of the men as he began frisking and searching Tom. No doubt about it, Tom was scared, but somewhere in Tom's mind, he was justifying what was happening. These men seemed like agency men. They seemed very professional. Tom asked a few questions, trying to determine who they worked for and what their purpose was, but there was no direct answers. Don't worry, sir. We have no intention of harming you. We only have some questions and some things to show you, and you can go on to work. The contents of Tom's pockets in his phone were put in a small tray. One of the men took Tom's key fob and Tom's phone and handed it out the window to someone Tom couldn't see. Then the van started moving. Over the next 20 minutes or so, the van was on some highway while the men stripped Tom to his underwear and socks. Then he was placed on a small metal seat that jutted from the van wall. When the van stopped, a man in the back of the van that had been doing something on a laptop spoke up. We're in, he barked. The laptop was spun around. There was an image of a small child's body, cut in half and partly burned. There are some things you need to look at, and then we'll have some questions for you, Mr. Smith. For the next few minutes, a little slideshow was displayed for Tom. Pictures of dead children, an old woman torn apart but still struggling to live, a wedding party blown to bits by a hellfire strike, before and after pictures of an upscale home in Syria, Now nothing but rubble, and finally a close-up picture of a small boy that had been tortured with wire pliers. Then the pictures changed. Here was Tom standing at his mailbox. Here was Tom walking out of the church building. Now a picture of Tom sitting in traffic. Finally, a close-up picture of Tom standing on his back porch, sipping orange juice from a glass, except there was a bright red dot on his chest. Mr. Smith It's important for you to face what you really do for a living, stated one of the men. And one of the others drew very close to Tom's face and said quietly, Wouldn't it be sad if something like this happened in Warrington? That little boy is about the same age as your son. The first man pulled the other man back and said, Now there's no need to worry about something like that, Mr. Smith. We would never let that happen. The laptop image changed, and Tom realized he was looking at his bank's homepage. Over the next few minutes, Tom, with the help of his captors, moved money out of Tom's accounts into a Bitcoin account. Then the van began moving again. Tom was allowed to get dressed as the van moved down the highway. No one spoke. When the van stopped again, Tom was fully dressed. The first man that had grabbed Tom's arm in the beginning spoke clear and slow. Now here's what's going to happen next. Your car is here waiting for you. You will be free to go. You will not speak about this to anyone. We want to be vividly clear. You don't want us to come back to visit you again because we won't be nice the next time. When you step out of this van, a kind of timer will start. That timer will take for exactly six months from today. Then that timer will pop your name up on someone's schedule. You need to have quit your job by that day. Otherwise, a process will start that can't be reversed. You have six months to get out of your government job, and you must never work for the government or any government contractor again. Otherwise, very bad things will happen. And again, you need to stay quiet about what happened today. Otherwise, what will happen, Mr. Smith? There was a pause. Mr. Smith, I need for you to say it. 
What will happen if you talk about this? Tom slowly spoke. Bad? Bad things, Mr. Smith. Very bad things. The van door opened and the man handed Tom the items from the tray. Tom stepped out into the light while the van door slammed and the van drove away. Tom looked around. It took a second, but Tom knew where he was. Tom was standing in front of his car in the Dick's Sporting Goods parking lot just down Columbia Pike from the Pentagon. His key fob and phone were on the hood of his car. End Part 3 Ethics-Based Selective Irregular Warfare